My name is Amal Nirgunkar, I'm the CEO of Patient Prism, and I am uh, thrilled to welcome uh, Brian Kaleo from uh, Dykema, who is uh, he's the director of their DSO industry group and uh, a well-known speaker uh, at, at most conferences that, that I have gone to over the last few years. And um, we're talking about DSOs this morning, and um, the, the topic uh, for this segment is really the stages of the evolution. And I, I've heard you speak about this at, at various conferences, and. Uh, I really want to understand, like, how do you? What are those stages? Like, how do you evolve from, you know, your you own your one dentist owner practice to this 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 big behemoth uh, with like the likes of Heartland or PDS? So, what's that evolution look like? Well, a short history of the in industry. Uh, you know, hundreds of years. You know, about I think they said. Uh, 150 years ago, Vardaman Black, the first dentist. If you go to dental school, they learn about Vardaman Black. You know, the traditional model was a single dentist-owned solo practice, and sure. that's what you had. The last, you know, 20, 25 years, you, you evolved from a single dentist-owned solo practice to a dentist or a dentist might take on partners and might have multiple locations. Again, sure. there wasn't necessarily a grand plan to roll it up <laughs> sell it or do something, but it was this one location is successful, so let's do another location, another one, yeah. or let's do even three or four locations, but they were still 100% dentist owned. Then the evolution that you see happening from that is, you know, you often see, sometimes people will skip to step four, but you often you'll see a step three where the dentist owned uh, group practice tries to do their own DSO, and it's it maybe they haven't, um, you know, they've put a rough management agreement together, they've sure. created a management entity, but they haven't done it completely. What you'll see sometimes in a startup is perhaps not all the leases, not all the equipment, not all the non-clinical employees or intellectual property makes its way up to the DSO, sure. but somebody created a DSO entity, there will be some agreements in place and there'll be some version of that going on. The final step is what we call a mature regulatory compliant DSO. This typically is owned and operated by non-dentists, not always, but typically. And what you would expect to see is all of the equipment, all of the leasehold interests, all of the intellectual property, all of the non-clinical employees will reside at that DSO uh, uh, level. And you're going to have regulatory compliant business agreements in place. I see very often where dentists have taken their own stab at you know, doing a startup DSO. Maybe they got a lawyer from their country club or somebody yeah. that's not really skilled in the dental field, but they know a little bit about it and they've put together a rough management agreement. When you're at stage four, you're going to have a complete set of regulatory compliant DSO business agreements. This could be management agreement, it could be license agreement, a succession planning agreement, a sublease and equipment use agreement, a HIPAA business associate agreement. You're going to have all of the proper suite of agreements in place and they're going to be regulatory compliant and then you're going to have, as we've said, the equipment, the uh, leasehold, the intellectual property and the non-clinical employees will be at the DSO level. So stage three and four are really when you start becoming kind of a DSO, right? Stage yeah. four is, yes, I, I mean, stage three, sometimes I've seen them all. People do more harm than good okay. by taking uh, a stab at being a DSO but not being compliant. I, I, I mention it. It's important for us to talk about it here because it's all over the marketplace. There are people that are listening to this that are probably in that yeah. category, people that are about to be that category. So it's important to talk about it, but I don't recommend taking a, you know, a half-hearted attempt at a DSO, you need to get counsel that understands the space and you need to put together a regulatory compliant model. But I don't want to bury my head in the sand. I have to be real. There, Stage three is out there and we need to talk about it. <laughs> so just because you're dentist owned in stage three doesn't mean you don't have regulatory compliance. Right? You still Correct. have to deal with 
all the stuff, and you can't legal zoom out of your way out of it. You, you cannot, and a lot of folks have tried to. <laughs> and do legal we zoom out of it. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I think that's a good way. I understood exactly what you were saying when you said that. And, and, and a lot of people, I mean, it's not quite legal zoom. It's they've hired their country club lawyer or right. somebody that does their real estate but doesn't have particular expertise in the DSO space. And these regulations are very serious. You know, the corporate practice of dentistry is a felony in many states. It's a misdemeanor in others. You know, sure. bad things can happen if you don't structure these things appropriately. And the moment, I mean, the moment you have non-clinical uh, owners um, uh, that are coming in, whether it's a private equity group or... Non-dentist owners non, up there, yes. Yeah, non-dentist owners, then you have no choice but to be at stage four. You, you've got to evolve yourself quickly into this mature framework where you have to understand the state laws. Uh, because, again, as I, as I understand... The laws are not federal, but state. It's very state-based. There's 50 different Dental Practices Act. It's really specific. We categorize them all states as strict, lenient, moderate, and strict moderate. We have four categories, and you know it, it depends on what state you're in as to what your agreements have to say to be compliant. But sure. you, you touched on a really good point a few minutes ago. I don't recommend anybody be non-compliant. I really don't. How could I possibly be director of my group and say it's okay to do that? But if you're dentist owned, right. you do have some leeway. It's not optimal, but if you're not completely compliant, the likelihood of you getting away with it, you know, you've got some leeway. But it's the second you bring in non-dentist owners, you have no leeway whatsoever. I mean, and you have to be 100 percent compliant. You can't be even 95 percent, because even the smallest mistake could 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 land you in a lot of trouble. Correct, and could, could shut you down. Uh, the regulators require that the dentist-owned organizations fix things, but they do seem to have patience. If they come in and they say, "Okay, you didn't do this right, but you've got dentist owners. You know, you got to fix it, but we're probably not going to throw the book at you." But the sure. second you have non-dentist owners, you have no leeway whatsoever. So the evolution can happen pretty fast, right? Yes. From stage one to stage four. You can go from stage one right to stage four and skip over. If, if you're a solo practice and you want to affiliate with a DSO and want to be acquired, you're going to skip right to stage four without ever going to a group practice or a startup. And, and, and the takeaway from this segment, I feel, is that uh, getting the right professionals involved at the right time is critical. It, it really uh, is. And because you want to, you know, you want to start on the right foundation and, and, and understanding the legal foundation of your state, how it relates to the laws. And, and it's easy because, again, we don't know what we don't know. So it's, it's important to, uh, you know, hire the right people that know this industry and know your state laws. Because, you know, attorneys come in all forms, just like physicians, you know. Your rheumatologist and a cardiologist, they don't, they, although they're doctors, but they're not really can treat, you know, uh, your, your same ailment. So, I mean, the further you go down the road of non-compliance, just the more expensive. I mean, obviously, everybody knows if you're non-compliant, the regulators can get, you can get in trouble with the regulators. But sure. there's something that people don't necessarily focus on is, let's say you got away with it. You didn't get in trouble with the sure. regulators, but you went down the road and you went from one office to two offices to three offices to four offices, and they're all non-compliant. It's going to be exponentially more expensive to clean that up later the bigger you get even if you were never caught and you never had right. a problem right. now we've got four or five offices that are non-compliant and to clean that up is a lot more expensive than if you did it correctly the first time through perfect perfect uh, uh, ending to the segment uh, you want to make sure you're compliant from the beginning and it's going to be more expensive to take care of this stuff so understanding these four stages of the DSO evolution is important but also understanding that you need to get the right people on the bus as far as advisors and legal counsel at the right time to, to, to navigate these waters that are very murky um, in, in every state you operate in is very important. So thank you for this wonderful thank discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. This was wonderful.